And we now have uh, a very challenging uh, uh, discussion time about tumor progression. And uh, we have three speakers that will look at three different perspectives. One is about iron, and Mario Di Cato will do that. Another one is about ESAs, and Pere Gascon will tackle the issue. And finally, we'll have Donna Span on transfusions and tumor progression. So Mario, tell us, does iron influence tumor progression, yes or no? Most of the data is old, observational, and not very past. So it, to set the stage, cancer developed as a multi-step process secondary to endogenous and exogenous effects. That's not new. Oxygen-free radicals are mostly endogenous products. And antioxidants, as far as they have been used, vitamin C, carotenoids, selenium, and so on, can balance this effect. But preventive measures with antioxidants have clinically not shown any significant effect so far. So it seems to make th that it would make sense to avoid endogenous oxidative stress rather than uh, to correct by using antioxidants uh, that are ingested. Iron has a high oxidative potential and reactive oxygen species is uh, all over the place. And carcinogenesis is induced through DNA damage and there is some literature on uh, uh, anti-oncogenes uh, uh, affected essentially the three that I mentioned there is P53, retin retinoblastoma, and CDK2A. In vitro, on cell cultures, iron improves cancer cell growth. So that's just to give you a general uh, idea. If you look at the literature, there are stacks of papers that have been published, masses. And uh, here I will give you a few epidemiological studies, and these are all referenced in a nice review that just came out. So there are five cohort studies in association between high iron intake and cancer risk. There's one large cohort study showing an association between transferrin saturation and cancer risk. There are three case control studies showing an association between ferritin levels and colorectal polyps. And one study showed an inverse correlation between transferrin saturation, ferritin levels, and colorectal cancer risk. And colorectal cancer in this whole topic is, uh, from the clinical point of view, uh, one of the most looked at uh, uh, entities. There is a correlation between red meat consumption and colorectal risk. Uh, this is a study done by uh, Yark, which is also in the references uh, that I mentioned. Uh, the main uh, leader of the study was uh, Ari Boli, and uh, I had not realized, but we had participated in this study. This is like 15 years ago. But you were supposed to say what people were eating uh, 10 years during the past 10 years, this in my mind did not make sense. Uh, then, as far as uh, hemochromatosis homozygosity goes, there is 2.5, four times increase in colorectal cancer risk. Uh, other epidemiological data, there are no biological mechanisms for excess iron excretion, so that's not planned in the system. Uh, on the other hand, uh, iron reduction by phlebotomy every six months decreases visceral cancer risk significantly. And uh, this was published in, international journal, in the Journal of National Cancer Institute. And I will detail in the next slide uh, this study a little bit more. Uh, hereditary hemochromatosis homozygosity gives you a 240 time increase of risk for hepatocellular carcinoma versus age match control. This is based on a publication also in the Journal of National Cancer Institute in 1985. And if you go through the literature, everybody's referring to that publication. There's not really anything significant new. If you look at the Harrison, which I did when I started this uh, textbook, standard textbook, it says that hemochromatosis, 16% of patients get hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, in my institution, over the years, we are following some 150 patients. And I haven't seen one hepatocarcinoma yet. So there are problems with, uh, with definitions, especially uh, chronic liver damage, because uh, very often in the elder studies, like uh, that one was done in 1985, and in 1989 only hepatitis C virus was described. So uh, there might be a mix, a mix of uh, pathologies. What is interesting, I did not know about this at all, endometriosis, you have hemorrhagic retention, so you get localized iron overload, and this goes along with an ovarian cancer risk. There are several studies on that. And for mesothelioma, there are different types of asbestos fibers. 
and it seems that only those who contain iron are carcinogenic. And there's a whole series of observations of uh, uh, mesotheliomas, abdominal mesotheliomas, essentially. So the study I was mentioning before is cancer risk reduction through phlebotomy. Uh, here, the phlebotomy was done to treat peripheral artery disease. And uh, so this was published in the Journal of National Cancer Institute, as you can see, in 2008. Uh, this is an ad hoc uh, study now, because the, the, the purpose of the study was uh, different, was peripheral artery disease treatment. So out of 1,277 patients, phlebotomy was done in 636, and the control, 641. The, the data were prospectively collected, so it was nicely done. Follow-up average was 4.5 years, and baseline ferritin was the same in both groups. The risk of visceral malignancy, so one group versus control, was in numbers of patients 38 versus 60, which is a P.03. New, as far as these new cancers were concerned, there was a lower mortality versus control cancer specificity, specific mortality. So those patients had a lower mortality while they had cancer, and the all-cause mortality was also uh, uh, significantly, statistically significant, with 0.009. What is amazing in this study is that uh, a phlebotomy was done every six months in these patients with the idea of treating peripheral artery disease. And after the first phlebotomy, you already see an advantage in cancer. So there must be some kind of bias somewhere. And there is an editorial coming along with this uh, uh, paper by Ed Green, which has uh, done several studies on iron and cancer, and who is very cautious about the interpretation of the data of this study. But it's referred constantly to. So this study is mentioned in all later uh, observational epidemiological studies. <coughs> Uh, this, there is another hemochromatosis and cancer study which was just, has not been printed, it's just published uh, electronically. And here uh, the authors, they looked at uh, homozygous uh, hemochromatosis and they used transferrin saturation as a proxy for iron overload. So there were no measurements, no imaging, no liver magnetic resonance or cardiac magnetic resonance to look at uh, overload. And this is a population-based study with a large number of patients. And as you can see, uh, the first, uh, uh, after 15 years of follow-up, uh, out of 1,417, the first cancer showed. Stratification by 10 years and smoking was also done. So they looked at what happened. They, they stratified by smoking and looked also at 10 years. Now, the women transfer in saturation considered above 60 versus less than 50. So they were assuming that it was overload versus no overload. There was a hazard ratio for 3.6 on any cancer, not, not limited to any kind of cancer, but any cancer, not hepatocellular carcinoma only or so. In men, the hazard ratio was 3.7 for any cancer and 39 versus 27% uh, versus uh, smokers versus non-smokers. So the odds ratio for any cancer, uh, for transfer in saturation, was uh, uh, more than 60% versus a reference of 1.5 in women and men. The conclusion of the study is that the elevated uh, transfer in saturation in women and homozygous hemochromatosis in men is associated with an increased risk of cancer. So this is all observation. Uh, there is a study uh, which was also published in the Journal of National Cancer Institute, looking at donation frequency, iron loss, donation of blood, frequency, iron loss, and risk of cancer among blood donors. This is a, a big study. You can see the, it's 10,866 control, case control study, blood donors with the cancer development individually matched controls of 107,000. This is a Scandinavian study. The relative risk is estimated according to number of donations or estimated iron loss at 3 to 12 years before cancer diagnosis. That's so they follow up on patients. Repeated blood donations not associated with increased or decreased risk of cancer overall. So this is in contradistinction to the phlebotomy study of, uh, from uh, before, where here, uh, looking at blood donors, there is no uh, increased or decreased risk of cancer overall. But on the other hand, in the same study, this, this uh, is an, a subset analysis frequent plasma donation correlated with non-Hodgkin lymphoma. This is the study I mentioned, 1985, malignancies in genetic hemochromatosis and other non-alcoholic liver disease, 
small number of patients, but still published in the German National Cancer Institute, but it was in 1985. 208 patients with homozygous hemochromatosis, uh, 16 had uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, and eight other cancers. So this is about 200 times more than expected. 148 non-alcoholic chronic liver diseases, so these were non-hemochromatosis, non-alcoholic. There was one hepatocarcinoma and one other cancer. Uh, patients were followed for a long period of time, from time of diagnosis till the event. But with the caution that uh, hepatitis C has been described later, and I think the studies, uh, Dr. Delaru might know that, uh, the studies about, about uh, hepatitis B in the genome, uh, in the DNA of hepatocarcinoma, which was described in France, uh, I forget the name of the author, he died shortly after that. Um, they had in their hemochromatosis patients, in, in genetic hemochromatosis, a fairly large number of patients where DNA, viral DNA was integrated. <coughs> More, this is uh, something I learned this morning uh, with, uh, in my uh, first course of nephrology. Uh, mortality from cancer among U.S. hemodialysis patients, patients who were on dialysis between 1995 and 2005, 873,493 hemodialysis between 1995 and 2005. Cancer mo specific mortality was stable. So this is a long-term follow-up of a large number of uh, patients in patients who are on chronic hemodialysis, that means they are getting all the drugs that were given at the time of the follow-up, including iron and uh, uh, ESAS. So in this large study, there was actually no difference. This is a slide which I have shown also at, uh, uh, Marty has seen that slide, I've shown that at uh, uh, ECHO in Stockholm. This is a study which was shown first at EHA this year uh, by Steinmetz, a German study, multi-center study, uh, which is not directly linked to uh, cancer, but uh, might be linked to the treatments that we are doing. And I think it's interesting uh, maybe to have the opinion of uh, iron experts uh, in the room on this study. What you can see here is the evolution comparing uh, ferrocarboxy-pericarboxymaltose only uh, ferrocarboxymaltose plus ESAS, all the patients, and then the sensor or not sensor group. And you can see that uh, they start at a low hemoglobin, but they end up including the uh, ferrocarboxymaltose only group at the same result as those who had ESAS plus iron. Uh, what also is interesting in this study is that they looked at subgroup, uh, sub uh, they divided the patients into subgroup depending on the level of ferritin at the start, and that did not affect the evolution, and also on the level of hemoglobin at the start did not affect the evolution. So this has been shown and has been uh, published in the form of an, uh, in the form of, in the form of an uh, abstract and poster but it's not, the details are not yet available, but you have a large number of patients, 130 patients, and it would be very interesting to see the details of the study and to see if there is a confirmatory study on this issue. Thank you for your attention. The way approach is to, to put the setting where we are. Oh, I made these questions last night. So after more than 20 years of using ESSAS, we have now a big question mark, big cloud on top of them. How did we arrive here? How are we now in terms of safety? And any data on the progression, yes or no? So this was really my mm -hmm. agenda. So when everything is started here. This is the most <laughs> publicized paper ever, and it never should have been published in Lancet, but things are the way they are. Uh, everybody knows in this audience this paper, but there are some interesting features I would like to pinpoint, all right? So this shows really that uh, the ESAs were detrimental. This was uh, uh, only right therapy patients with head and neck and completely off the label. Hemoglobins went to 16 and 17, mm -hmm. etc. So we know this by, by heart. Uh, so now, this is interesting also to, to, to put the setting so we, we know where we are now. So it's very interesting that of all the head and neck tumors on this paper, only the hypopharyngeal tumor 
was the one that really, oh, sorry, I couldn't, oh, was the only one that really uh, was negative against Ipo, and this one made the whole thing for the, for the rest of the study. So it's good to, to do not forget that. Now, uh, Henke, strike back. <laughs> Strike, strike back one more time. And there's a, there's a paper that you have yes, you showed to us, okay? But I have something to add to, you, to your talk. So I'm not going to say what Ole Juhayim has mentioned to you, that he got some, some of the patients from the first paper use a C20 polyclonal antibody, non-specific, and find out that those who had the EPO receptor quoted and quoted, which now we know that he shot prog in 70, had worse prognosis than the ones who were negative. We are now, that, as Johan probably has stated, there's probably these cells, these patients already, by definition, are poor prognosis because cells are suffering hypoxic pH, blah, blah, blah. But there's something that um, I was uh, uh, Saturday in, in Paris with John Glaspie. And John Glaspie told me that the, uh, the Henke asked the people who wrote the paper, the Hanka. The Hanka is a copy of this paper, but by the Danish, basically. It never has been published to my knowledge. It's like an e, e, email sort of story, like a internet numbers. And so Henke, apparently, this is more than probably one year and a half, didn't publish yet the data. So probably cannot reproduce the data. That's, that's what he feels. So the Henke uh, did the same thing in the Henke's hands. So far, it's more than one year and a half. Nothing has been published. So you can make whatever you want. So there's a, some, a, some add information to your slide. Now, this is one of the, the worst uh, like pictures I've seen in many years. We in the area of EPOS or SS. And I cannot believe in uh, such a serious journal of nature medicine after the Henkes paper was an editorial with that slide. I think that this is, was terrible and a lack of clinical judgment or ethics, I would say, you know where they assume, okay, according to the Haggis paper, that EPO receptors are here properly, but probably are here, and this, this will explain. So to make not just an editorial, but a figure, m means uh, this, this was a low blow to the whole field. But that's why we're here now, that's why I'm, I'm talking to you this afternoon. Now, which data we have in favor against this possibility? So, <clears throat> these are basically, we have A papers, all right, which are negative. I don't want to go through you. There's the best. But one point I want to mention to here, except for the prepare, and this one, basically, all of AO, they be all. And the Hanka and Henke, basically, is a carbon copy, one from the other, okay? And the prepare, as Matty has mentioned this morning, is not really a negative one. It's a tend to, to it's, it's not statistically, statistically significant. So I don't know what, in all classification, you put this as a ne negative one. So statistically, it was not significant, so that's what has to be stated in all the classification. But anyhow, it's here. But see, we remove this, probably are not eight, are less than eight, and much older publications. Now, the new studies, so he gonna repeat a lot of what Matty has mentioned this morning. I know put for uh, uh, the, the brave study where Matty is the first author, which is in breast cancer, all right, which is a negative, it's a neutral study. So we can put seven studies here. We add the brave study on Ipo Vita by, by Mati. So I'm gonna go a little bit with all those here, uh, ending with the, the latest one, with the gel, which I has been mentioned. So this is a MEBIS study. It has those then sequential chemotherapy with uh, this combination, with conventional scale chemotherapy. This is a curative study, all right? So, in terms of progression-free survival, there's no differences, okay? In terms of survival, there's no differences in the adjuvant therapy, so it's a curative one. So that's why we have maybe to revisit. I was very concerned with this morning, that I, uh, it was a, uh, a slide that FDA has said that we should never use, like prohibited, you know, to use the assets in the curative setting. So Matty has shown three papers this morning where in the curative setting, there's not signal, signal alarm in all of the, the papers, papers published recently, and he, I want to emphasize that. So this is good for that. Now, this is John Glaspie, did this meta-analysis, okay, study level meta-analysis, okay, 
on SSN oncology in radiation chemotherapy and chemotherapy, including off label trials. 15,323 patients, 60 trials. Okay? So, basically, what I want just to pinpoint here is that for cancer induced anemia, is no signal alarm, 1.03. Okay? You, you probably see these slides a lot. Okay? Now, this is uh, from this classification of the 60 trials, they pick up now 26 control studies in anemia of cancer, radiotherapy only or chemotherapy. Those are prog they, they specifically they look at the progression related endpoints, all right? And of these, this you see the point comes here, really neutral. There's all in all sides, only this is an outer layer, but basically it comes right here when we put it all together. And this is just looking for progression. <coughs> now this Heinz probably have a lot of things to do here. This is a wonderful uh, like meta-analysis by, by Heinz Ludwig, and I just pick up three points of the paper because in the paper there's a lot, a lot of like, um, uh, uh, conclusions, very interesting, but for the sake of the time and for the discussion of progression, I just pick up three. Uh, uh, Heinz, if I'm writing something wrong, just correct me, okay? <laughs> but this, uh, to evaluate the effect of double pointing versus placebo, we've got safety in transfusions, Okay, all at randomized, double blind with a placebo control arm patient with anemia induced by chemotherapy. Now, there are six, six uh, papers studied, okay, solid tumors, lymphoid lung cancer, lung cancer, all right. So, overall survival, very interesting here, including long term follow up. Look at this, we, here we go to 240 weeks. Uh, a year has 50 weeks. We're talking almost like a uh, almost four years and a half. So it's a long-term follow-up to see for the survival, the impact on SS, okay, in these patients. So overall survival with a four years and a half follow-up, nothing happens, okay? So this a neutral result. Now progression for survival, the two curves overlap, okay, again with four years uh, and a half of follow-up. So this is very interesting, nothing, nothing happens. But this is like very provocative. I put that slide because I think this will originate a lot of the, a lot of discussion. Is uh, Heinz has pick up something that for many of us is a concern: the relationship with transfusions and SS in a close period of time. So, and then uh, Heinz find that uh, those people who receive well, it increased in hemoglobin more than one gram in 14 days means they got some transfusions. These people did worse, much worse. All on this side of the curve, following the transfusion. Rather, if those, the patients in that same study did not get any transfusion, those are all here. Here is just due to thrombosis, which we all know. But in terms of survival, okay, and progression for survival, they are in the good side of the curve. And the, those who receive one unit or more in 14 days prior, okay, so they have poor. So this comes to, to the point I recall Jerry Spivak one year in a similar meeting like that, I think it was in Sitges, and uh, he, he wrote a beautiful review in the oncologist uh, where he, he was very concerned on using, in, the, in his review, using SS and, and, uh, and transfusion at the same time. And he was believe almost in that maybe it's a possibility that the bad press or some of the studies on SS Maybe it's not due to SS, but due to the combination or the use of transfusions, as probably we're going to see in, in, the, in the speaker follow, follow me. So I think this, I put it here to generate discussion after our talks. Well, this is the PREPARE, okay, another curative uh, uh, study. Uh, uh, in this one, although there's a trend for worsening in the double poetin, uh, in the survival, and this is for survival, is not 0.06 and 0.1, so it's not significant. So we can consider that at least neutral. Uh, this is chemotherapy in high risk cervical cancers, the Novo Ago intergroup study, okay? And it's very interesting because my, my radiotherapists um, who used to, used to use a lot of erythropoietins, things that Hank is stu uh, study, they're really uh, limiting tremendously the use of EPOS. So this is a very nice uh, paper by Blomer, okay? It's also a, a, a curative study. And what he finds out is, uh, again, 
this a neutral study, you can see a progression through survival, okay, and then overall survival is a trend in progression through survival, it looks 0 0.06, okay, five years, 78% chemo per simple versus 70, okay? So it's something is a trend there, but at least it's not negative. And again, it's a curative one, a real recent study done, okay? So again, another current uh, 2011 paper, again, neutral or a trend to be beneficial in terms of the, of the uh, SNR. Now this is, I'm finishing here, basically, because that's what we have in, over the last year, year and a half. Okay, uh, again, 2011, uh, Dr. Delarue. Uh, so if I make a mistake, just correct me in the discussion. But basically, the protein increase, this also in, in non hodgkins lymphoma, diffuse non hodgkins lymphoma, curative in 10, obviously. Uh, so the, the, I show you the three that Matthew this morning he showed, curative in 10, the three come out negative uh, or neutral, okay? So progression to survival three years, 66% in darbopoietin alpha versus 58, okay? This is for survival three years, okay? This is 0.2, or survival doesn't count the significance. And these are the curves, okay? You saw this this morning, okay? Clear curves favoring darbopoietin, in this case significant. And again, survival, it looks a trend, it is true, it just goes like down like gravity, <laughs> okay? So something is here, but at least we cannot claim is, I would say it's a positive study in favor of uh, an ESSA, all right? Now, another thing from this paper is that hazard ratio ESSA versus no ESSA is of 27% beneficial to ESSA. That's a good, a good hazard ratio, okay? And I think around 0 0.7 is a good, a good one, and obviously significant. Um, and basically, I have my last two slides. Conclusions on this is progression. There were variations among all the studies in terms of things, progression for survival, or either local regional relapse, tumor response, or tumor progression, and the quality of the data. Very mixed bag. And then, in some of the papers uh, came out these, the only study that in a rigorous way evaluated radiologically the tumor progression by a central and independent committee was a study AMG 2010-145, which is studied with arbopoietin alpha by Dr. Pirka with a non-small cell lung cancer. Results from this study, the only one that really look at independent committee radiologically, there's a progression of the lesions in the CT scan, uh, show the also neutral effect of arbopoietin alpha. So this is clear cut that the new studies I showed to you, basically none, none of them shows a detrimental effect on the SS. And my last one, which basically a, a, a condensation, what I mentioned to you, I said although there are some studies with SS, most off-label, show an active impact on survival in patients with cancer, recent studies show that patients with cancer to the SS, according to the registry, as the ones I mentioned to you, some in curative intent, the impact on survival and progression for survival has been either neutral or in favor of the SS. Thank you very much. Now, um, the, RB, the, the effect of RBC transfusion on uh, head and neck surgery cancer patients, um, I was told to start with this uh, topic since, uh, you know, as has, has been presented, this was the area where, where the, the whole discussion started in this area. This is a recently published uh, database analysis on 520 patients observed over uh, about two years, and the outcome was evaluated in terms of Recurrent free, uh, uh, recurrence free survival or overall, overall survival. And what you see here is the cumulative um, survival. And these are the patients without transfusion, and these are the patients with transfusion. So there is a huge and statistically significant difference in disfavor of patients who have been transfused, the same was uh, found for recurrent free uh, uh, survival. So in disfavor of transfusion. This is from, the, from Ripple Operations, also a prospective database uh, in the years 2000-2008, 220 patients also observed for a relatively long period of time. And the outcome was analyzed in qualitatively in terms of have the patients received uh, blood transfusion, yes, no, and 
Then another type of analysis was, you know, taking into account the number of RBC units given. And then the authors made a, a big discussion about intra versus post-operative transfusions, which I cannot follow, but uh, we will come back to that. So first of all, uh, about two thirds of the patients were transfused. And here you have any transfusion, the qualitative distinction patients uh, who were not transfused had a recurrent free survival of 15 months versus 10 months in those uh, who were transfused. So this was not significant overall survival, however, 20 versus 15 was significant. Here you see, you know, the dose response. So these are the patients not being transfused. The more you were transfused, the lower uh, the, uh, the, the, the duration or the period of recurrent free survival, which was significant those overall survival there was in those response. Uh, again, in this favor of those being transfused. This was the uh, univariate analysis, and this is the multivariate analysis um, on, on um, recurrence-free survival. And you see here that for any unit of transfusion, you have 8% increase, highly significantly, uh, that reduces your chances of really having a long recurrence-free survival. Again, a uh, negative effect of blood transfusion on outcome. This is another prospective database with 500 patients. In this uh, study, local reduced RBCs were used to 100%, and the search into morbidity was assessed during hospitalization, and there were also 104 patients with medical complications, but for some reason they decided to only look at patient surgical complications. And what they found is that in a multivariate analysis, that the transfusion of RBCs uh, as a yes, no answer was a, a really a very significant and quantitatively important risk factor for surgical complications. Uh, therefore, again, the transfused patients did not have a, a benefit. We have uh, uh, done a meta-analysis on patients undergoing colorectal cancer surgery. Um, we found uh, about 20,000 patients observed over for 59 months, so 108,000 patient years of observation, uh, observation. Again, a high number of patients being transfused, and the uh, RBC transfusion were found to be, in a multivariate way, uh, a significant uh, risk factor to increase mortality increase cancer-related mortality, and you know, 1.7, that's a, an important uh, uh, amount of increased uh, mortality. It's not only highly significant, but it's also relevant. And the combined recurrence metastasis death uh, occurrence was also more frequent in those being transfused, and infections was three times more, uh, more more prevalent in those being transfused and the length of hospital stay was also prolonged. So this is uh, economically very important. And this is an interesting study since it is a, um, a reanalysis. It's the second reanalysis apparently al already in this uh, initial prospective randomized trial. Uh, the only one, uh, you know, before 2000 um, and from the 500 uh, 89 patients in the initial study that was set up to, 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 to observe the difference between transfusion of buffy code reduced and leukocode reduced uh, RBCs. Um, 448 could be studied uh, why there was this difference, uh, and I didn't find out. I read the paper many times, but I did not find out. But uh, anyway, maybe you're more uh, smarter than I am, maybe you find it out. Now, anyway. The chances to being alive at 15 years later is 43% when you were not transfused initially, but only about 27 or 28 when you were. And this is highly significant. And interestingly, we have looked at that before. The, uh, the causes for extra death in the entire population were, were the additional cardiovascular death. These are the non-transfused. These are you know the two different transfused groups, and both were. More, I mean, this is just. Uh, missed statistical significance, but you know when you when combined, they were highly statistically significant. And for rectal cancer, the cancer-related mortality, you know, can, it was a strong trend for an increased mortality in transfused versus non-transfused patients. 
Now this is the, part the, the study that I alluded to in the morning uh, where we did this analysis on the American College of Surgeons database and that's a national security quality improvement program uh, from the year 2008 and there were 227,000 patients and we uh, analyzed the outcome of non-anemic patients versus mildly anemic patients versus moderate to severe anemic patients and the outcome was mortality and the seven types of major morbidity for which the database was set up. And, you know, these are kind of the highlighted um, um, results. First of all, preoperative anemia was 30%, and this is uh, a, a very high number, and if you have confronted with that number the first time, you think that's not, even, that's not possible. But unfortunately, this is the really, really existing reality. Um, in orthopedic surgery, between 20 and 30 percent of patients are anemic at the time of the highly elective surgical surgery. Cardiac uh, surgery, 25 to 50 percent of patients are anemic when being operated, elective cardiac surgery. And of course, you know, uh, colorectal cancer surgery, these patients are even higher numbers uh, or percentages uh, anemic, but there is a direct link to the, to the disease in the other two categories. Um, that's not the case and, and seems to be a modifiable risk factor. So 30% of the patients were anemic and mild anemia, and I think that's really uh, uh, quite astonishing, mild anemia already increased mortality by uh, 40% and uh, mild anemia also increased morbidity by about 30% when corrected for up to 70 Co potential co-founders and including RBC transfusions. And on the other side, RBC transfusions were associated with an odds ratio for mortality of two when corrected for the effect of preoperative anemia amongst the 70 other uh, potential co-founders. And also morbidity was uh, nearly doubled in those being transfused. Now, then um, we did some additional analyses. This is the analysis on the mortality. And you know, in different subgroups, that starts with, with age over 65, then cardiac disease, pulmonary severe COPD, CNS disease, renal disease, cancer. This is this one here, cancer. Um, then diabetes, systemic uh, infections, and obesity. And the three columns in each of these categories uh, uh, describes the mortality uh, if the patients did not have this uh, condition, nor anemia. So for example, these are the youngers without uh, uh, anemia. This column here is one of the two risk factors, you know, in this case, age or uh, anemia present. And this is combination of both age and uh, uh, anemia. And you see that's kind of an exponential increase in the mortality in all the different uh, categories, including cancer. And this uh, adjusted two here, that's the odds ratio that were, was corrected for, the, for up to 70 co-founders. And in all these categories, you know, there was an exponential increase. That means anemia and the positive factor that let, uh, let really explodes mortality. And about the same was found in, in terms of composite morbidity in the different uh, uh, groups. So that means you, know, you have a problem if you are in one of these groups, but when you are, in addition, if you are uh, anemic, then you have a really very, very big problem. We did not do that analysis for the RBCs, but uh, we, we could have done that and we can still do that. Um, now, then of course, um, if, if you are in a clinical setting, if you are uh, uh, facing the situation that you have a major operation, uh, in particular for a tumor or a cancer surgery, the, and, and you have like a week or two uh, uh, and in which you want to increase the preoperative hemoglobin level, then yeah, in the end, you know, it's EPO plus iron that you're giving. And then there's always the discussion, yeah, EPO, are we allowed to give EPO in this situation? And I, I think we are allowed to do that. Uh, there are a few studies that really looked at that. This is from uh, prostate uh, surgery. And uh, they, they were giving EPO in, in the, the, the 
dose is indicated on, uh, indicated on the slide, and they, they, they prospectively screened for myocardial infarction, DVT, and pulmonary embolization. And they, they looked at this um, in, in two different ways. One was that they looked uh, what was the EPO response, because, you know, as has been said several times today, the, the, more, the, the more exaggerated the response, the more likely the patients may have the complications. These are the patients who, in terms of hematocrit, have an increase of less than five points. Uh, here from, from five to seven and here above seven. So these were tercials. Uh, and, and you can see, first of all, the, 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 the incidence of these complications were all very low. And there was no difference between the different uh, groups in terms of response. Also, uh, in terms of which hematocrites were achieved prior to the operation, you know, they, they were, uh, you know, kind of the lowest ones, middle ones, and these are really excessive ones, so to speak. And again, you know, few complications and certainly not a difference. And uh, you were, may now say, well, he's not right. Okay, yes, there were two significant differences, but the, the complications were here in the lowest response rate, here in the lowest hematocrit. So, uh, you know, big response or high hematocrit was not an issue. This is another uh, interesting study uh, in, in the same uh, field where the um, urologists looked at long-term outcome in the prostate cancer surgery uh, patients and they uh, had you know the intermediate high risk or uh, progressive state of the prostate cancer at the time of surgery and this is the long-term outcome and the, the less progressive uh, tumor at the, at the time of the operation of course had a better long-term outcome. I show you this only because these authors were able with their uh, a methodology to show the difference in long-term outcome. They did the same for those who received EPO and not in the, not a long-term EPO, but preoperative preparations. And you, you can see that there is there's no signal whatsoever. So um, my conclusions are that RBC transfusion are indeed associated in cancer surgery with serious adverse outcome, namely more mortality and more morbidity. New treatment concepts are thus urgently needed to improve the survival of cancer patients and patient blood management. B, an may be an attractive uh, option. Patient blood management is nothing special. Patient blood management simply is what you did anyway, for example, for a patient with Jehovah's Witness. Because there you look for the preoperative anemia, whether there is anemia, if there is, you treat it. Then you, you tell your surgeon that, you know, for once you should not really create a big blood loss. Why don't you do it meticulously for once? Uh, and then, you know, anemia treatment is not, does not equal transfusion, and you can really achieve uh, a very good outcome uh, results like that. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to, to start this then with uh, a, a little... Uh, quiz on uh, query, uh, and it's coming back to you Donna because we had this discussion in the little subgroup this morning and uh, Heinz was one of those uh, asking the question that's why I asked him to come over here to what extent are these data not related to the fact that for one reason or the other I know you already asked the question but in front of everyone uh, related to transfusing patients that the gut feeling of the doctor says that this patient is not doing well, so I need to do something and <clears throat> I'm going to transfuse him. Yeah, basically this possibility is not absolutely excluded. Um, however, um, for example, in the, in the study and um, was recently published in the Lancet. We had 70 potential confounders, and we corrected the analysis for all these 70 confounders and the difference. Uh, you know, however you chose to uh, to to, 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 con, uh, to, con, uh, to control for these confounders, resulted in very similar uh, outcomes. The numbers changed a little bit, but basically it was always the same outcome. Second, um, the, the the percentage uh, of transfuse patients for any kind of surgery depends very little on the 
uh, comorbidity of the patients, but the, 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 the most important two factors that are related to the percentage of transfusion and the amount of transfusion is the fact of preoperative anemia, and in particular, the center at, where, at which you are operating. The, the, there are good studies uh, from cardiac surgery where the incidence of transfusion from center to center varies from 10 to 19 percent, and the patients were exactly the same. And there is a benchmark study that has been uh, performed in Austria on uh, cavity surgery, colorectal cancer surgery, and hip surgery, to, uh, published 2007 in transfusion, and they found also that you know from center to center, there are 15 centers, there was between 20 and 78 percent. And, and the patients were the same. So it's not the patients who are the sickest getting the transfusion. It, the, the center decides uh, the tradition uh, and some, some habits that, that, that whether the patient gets transfused, yes or no. And, you know, and, and afterwards I stop because it's, it's getting boring. There are only studies published that show a negative outcome. There is no studies published where you would see a beneficial effect, not, in a, not even in the sub. But, but there are a few studies, prospective randomized studies, uh, randomizing patients with the same hemoglobin uh, category to either transfusion or control. And those studies also show yeah. what we have shown. Usually the, the difference is a little bit smaller. So I think there is some evidence from prospective randomized trials, and I think that is the strongest evidence. Uh, still. When you talk about 70 confounding factors, uh, um, probably all of those who have looked at data, Matthew will know that very well, uh, that you do a Cox uh, regressional uh, analysis and in, in the end you end up with three or five factors which are responsible for, for well, contribute independently to survival. So I think the 70 confounding <coughs> factors are not so impressive. Probably these are only a few which are really independent uh, con um, confounding factors uh, which are responsible, uh, which impact on survival. So that's what, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I, I, I've been amazed <coughs> by the figure you said that in patients for, who go for orthopedic surgery who have 20-25% uh, of anemia at the start. Now, I had to do with the uh, rivaroxaban study uh, which is an anticoagulant, uh, and the early studies were in patients, uh, large numbers of patients, 6,000 patients, were patients who were on, uh, who had hip or knee surgery. And uh, that was by far not the number of patients who had anemia at the start, and they were not pretreated. Yeah, that's, that's possible, because in such studies you have already, you know, a whole list of exclusion and inclusion criteria. I honestly, I never believed these data myself. Thank you. <laughs> before, before we analyzed our own data, and we analyzed them in Switzerland, uh, in Lausanne, we have published that also. It was 21% of elective orthopedic surgery, you know, being anemic. And then after I returned to Zurich, you know, I had the same discussion with Zurich. <coughs> Zurich and said, well, that's, all, that's all only elsewhere memorial, but our patients are not anemic, because otherwise I wouldn't operate them. We did the, the same analysis, one year of data, 18%. And the, the more the patients come from nursing homes, the higher is, is that uh, percentage. Now, the, 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 the reason why there is such a discrepancy in, in Views might be that you know many of these anemic patients or many of these anemias are not severe, so they are in the range of 12 for males around 12 for females around 11, and so you know they they they, they get undiscovered or you know, the physicians look at the numbers and say well okay and, and don't think anything and and that goes with the with the expectation that you know low, that very mild anemia does not have an impact on outcome which is wrong. I, I, I would like to add, yes, you just touched a very important issue. Every time I give a talk, and um, I talk transitions, like an amateur, right? Uh, I have always a hostile audience. What we should do, or, or your area should do, to convince our colleagues of this data, 
because everybody said, well, the patient is sicker. Uh, they come with a, at least 70 or 80 confound uh, items. And I cannot convince them. If the data could be as strong as can be, they, they, our colleagues, they don't believe that. And you have to be very careful because blood has been associated to life, oxygen, life, you know what I mean? So transfusions always have been related to saving lives. So this concept, I think, blunts uh, my colleagues from accepting some data which will be probably a drug or a pharmaceutical agent, probably banned. Yep. So oh, I, I, what I, we should do to convince them? <laughs> well, that's probably one, you know, in, in 20 years' time, I, I, I write my memoirs on, on, on why, <laughs> was, why was the medical community so reluctant to see the obvious. Because at the moment, there are more than 500 papers on that subject in the parasurgical area. And you know, there are a few, few subgroups of patients where uh, uh, transfusion is really associated with an, with an uh, improved outcome. And, and one is from a rural Kenyan uh, uh, hospital where, uh, where uh, children were treated with, uh, for uh, uh, malaria-related anemia. And that at some days, you know, it's not prospective randomized, but at, at this hospital, at some, some days, there were RBCs available and some days were not. Mm -hmm. And this is completely by chance. Mm -hmm. And so they, they simply analyzed the outcome of transfused versus non-transfused children. And, and they found that if the hemoglobin was 3.9 grams per deciliter lower, transfusion improved outcome. If it was higher, uh, it did not do any, any good. And if it was about, uh, 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 more than seven, it did harm. And uh, now, or below 4.9 plus respiratory distress. So, you know, these are really niche indications. Or a, a big study, uh, more an observational uh, database study found that, you know, patients being, being operated with hematocrit of lower, below 24% plus having a blood loss of more than a liter, they had a better outcome when they were transfused as compared to when they were not transfused, but this was about 1.9% of the entire data set. And in all others, it was neutral uh, and then detrimental. Mm -hmm. But everybody speaks about the 1.9% where finally we could find a sub, sub, subgroup where it was beneficial. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions or comments to the panel? I, I have a comment. I think yes. we should be careful. I believe your data, but not, that's not a problem. I think we should be careful not to do with transfusions what Hanke did with Peter. Just oh, comment. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I completely agree with you. I think that the, the, you know the field is now, or the, the justification, or the, the 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 ideas are such that we can uh, propose a reasonable hypothesis, namely that you know preoperative treatment of anemia uh, results in a reduced uh, uh, administration. Uh, allergenic blood products and therefore improves outcome, but we need to prove that prospectively. Okay, I think that's with these words of we need a prospective study, we'll close this discussion point and we'll move to the next presentations. Thank you to all, okay. all of you.